On September 21st, 2016, I debated Dr. Frank Turek at Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas on the topic, Naturalism or Theism, What Better Explains Reality? In preparation for the debate, I developed a large number of PowerPoint slides for responding to his arguments. Dr. Turek recently published a book titled, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And so many of my slides were a prepared response to the arguments in his book. In his book, Stealing from God, Dr. Turek develops a six-point reductio argument against atheism based on the acrostic CRIMES, which stands for causality, reason, information and intentionality, morality, evil, and science. For each letter in CRIMES, naturalism or atheism can steal these concepts from God if and only if a naturalism is logically incompatible with the concept represented by that letter and b positing an all-powerful god explains that concept not just assumes it but as i will explain each letter in crimes fails one or both conditions now since repeatedly accusing an innocent person of a crime harms the accused i'm going to frame my response as an acrostic of my own Victim, value, induction, causality, time, information and intentionality, and morality. Instead of talking about crimes, what we instead need to talk about are the victims of Christian apologetics. The victims of Christian apologetics are things which Christian apologists falsely claim depend on God, but the truth is that God depends on them. Let's start then with the letter V for value. First, positing a morally perfect God assumes, not explains, objective value. God's moral perfection assumes the existence of moral value. It does not explain why moral values exist at all. A theistic explanation for moral value is equivalent to the claim, the reason there are any objective moral values is because there is at least one objective moral value, God's morally perfect goodness. This is a circular explanation. At best, it only explains other moral values in relationship to one moral value. It does not explain why there are any objective moral values at all. Second, naturalism is logically compatible with ontologically objective value because ontologically objective values just are values which are mind independent. Some atheists like G.E. Moore and Eric Wielingberg believe that moral values are ontologically objective and irreducible to non-moral properties. Other atheists, like Larry Arnhart and David Brink, think moral values are reducible to non-moral physical properties. I is for induction. Positing God assumes, not explains, induction. Furthermore, it is necessarily true that uniformity is intrinsically more probable than variety. Let's move on to the letter C for causality. Positing God assumes, not explains, causality. God's omnipotence presupposes causality. It does not explain why causality exists at all. Causality is uncreatable and uncausable. God cannot cause causality to exist since God would have to use causality before causality was created in order to create causality. But that's contradictory. The letter T is for time. Positing God assumes, not explains, time and it does so in two ways. First, God's personhood presupposes time. It does not explain why time exists at all. Although you will sometimes hear Christians say that God is a timeless person, the idea of a timeless person is at best unintelligible and at worst incoherent. Second, when Christians say that God caused the universe to exist, they are presupposing the existence of time. Even if they were right that God did cause the universe to exist, they are not explaining why time exists at all. This is because causation is inherently temporal. Causes always stand in temporal relations with their effects. Causes either happen before their effects or are simultaneous with their effects. And thus the claim God created time leads to self-contradiction. God's decision to create time either happened before time existed or was simultaneous with the beginning of time. But both options are self-contradictory since both options presuppose time exists before it existed. 
In order to be coherent, theism must posit that God is eternal, not timeless, and exists in metaphysical time, which is not created by God. And time began with the Big Bang must mean physical time began with the Big Bang, and so God's creation of time really means God's creation of physical time within a larger, all-encompassing metric of metaphysical time. While coherent, metaphysical time is deeply ad hoc. The notion of metaphysical time doesn't involve self-contradiction like God is timeless, but we have no independent reason. In other words, no reason that's independent of the evidence for the Big Bang model to posit an additional kind of time over and above physical time. Modern physics, special relativity, says that physical time is relative to motion and hence does not exist independently of space. We have every reason to say that there is only one kind of time, physical time, which is interwoven with space since they compose one object, space-time. Let's move on to the other letter I in victim, which stands for information and intentionality. Again, Dr. Turek claims that atheism steals these concepts from God, and again, I think he has it completely backwards. We'll start with information. Dr. Turek says that DNA exhibits complex specified information, or what I will call biological information. Biological information is a subset of a larger category, which I will call simply information. Dr. Turek's argument is that atheism has to steal information from God in order to account for the biological information in DNA. Two objections. Number one, naturalism is logically compatible with the existence of both biological information and generic information. Since naturalism is consistent with both of these things, it can't steal them from God. Number two, positing God assumes, not explains, information. God's omniscience presupposes the existence of information. It does not explain why information exists at all. If God's knowledge includes propositional knowledge, as all or virtually all theists assume it does, then God's knowledge includes information. All Turek has done is to build information into God. As for the concept of intentionality, I should probably first talk about what that means. Philosophers do not agree what it means, but one of the accepted definitions is directedness or aboutness of mental states, and that is the definition I will adopt. With that definition, then, I can offer my objections. Number one, naturalism is logically compatible with intentionality. There are physical things which are about other physical things, such as photographs and USB flash drives. If naturalism is compatible with intentionality, it can't steal intentionality from God. Number two, positing God assumes, not explains, intentionality. Dr. Turek assumes that God can create things which exemplify original intentionality as we do. But how can God do that? Our only experience of causing intentionality to exist is through human procreation. And as University of Iowa philosopher Evan Fales jokes, there are far too many cases of that happening which seem to involve no thought at all. Finally, let's turn to the letter M for morality. And here what I'm really talking about is a subset of morality or moral concepts, namely deontology or the study of moral obligations and moral duties. First, naturalism is logically compatible with moral duties and obligations for two reasons. A. Naturalism is compatible with objective moral duties and obligations existing as part of a causal reality. This view goes all the way back to Plato. In the last 100 years, it has been defended by atheist philosophers like G. E. Moore and Eric Wielenberg. According to moral anti-reductionism, Moral properties are not reducible to non-moral properties, they simply exist. And note that Dr. Turek simply rules out this possibility in advance. B. Naturalism is compatible with objective duties and obligations existing in causal reality, like in Aristotle's theory. Larry Arnhart recently defended a modern version of Aristotle's theory. Aristotle's theory, by the way, is at least part of the basis for natural law theory, which I believe is the ethical theory of the Catholic Church. So it's not some anti-God theory of ethics. My second objection is this. 
Positing a God who creates moral obligations by issuing commands does not explain moral obligation. It assumes a prior obligation to obey God's commands. Again, this does not explain why any moral duties or obligations exist at all. So, in sum, for each victim of Christian apologetics, we've seen that A, it is logically consistent with naturalism, and B, theism assumes, not explains it. So let's now return to Dr. Turek's crimes acrostic, starting with the letter C for causality. On page four of his book, Dr. Turek writes, since the universe had a beginning, it must have had a beginner. The evidence leaves us with two options, either one, no one created something out of nothing, which is, he says, the atheist view, or two, someone created something out of nothing, which is the theist view. This is a myth, but in fairness to Dr. Turek, some atheists have also spread this myth. They're wrong. Before I explain why that is a myth, first notice Dr. Turek overlooks a foundational fact about reality. Physical reality exists. This was the basis for my first argument for naturalism and against theism in my recent debate with him in Topeka, Kansas. Let me briefly summarize that argument. Let me begin by defining naturalism. By naturalism, I mean the view that the physical exists and if the mental exists, the physical explains why the mental exists. If naturalism is true, then there are no purely mental beings which can exist apart from a physical body, and so there is no God or any person or being much like God. So why does the existence of physical reality favor naturalism? If naturalism is true, then physical reality must exist. That's just part of what naturalism means. If theism is true, however, things look quite different. The existence of physical reality doesn't disprove theism. If God exists, God could have created physical space, matter, and energy as part of a plan to create a universe for human beings. But God could have also chosen to create other minds without physical bodies, such as angels. Or God could have chosen to create nothing at all. In other words, God's existence doesn't require a physical reality. So because the physical has to exist on naturalism, but does not have to exist on theism, it follows that the existence of physical reality is evidence favoring naturalism over theism. But we know more about cosmology than just the existence of physical reality. We also know the following more specific facts about cosmology. We know that the expansion of our universe had a beginning. We know that the physical laws, conditions, and parameters of our universe are life permitting. And we know that physical reality not only exists, but continues to exist. So the question is this, given that physical reality exists, don't these more specific facts favor theism over naturalism? Let's consider each of these facts in turn. First, let's consider what he says about the universe having a beginning. He says, atheists think no one created the universe out of nothing, and he doesn't have enough faith to believe that. I don't have enough faith to believe that no one created something out of nothing either, which is why I don't believe that. In fact, the whole notion that the atheist view is that no one created something out of nothing is a myth. In fairness to Dr. Turek, some atheists have also spread this myth. They're wrong. In fact, this argument reminds me of a common complaint I hear from theists when talking about atheistic objections to theism. The complaint goes something like this. Tell me about the God you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in that God either. Well, along the same lines, naturalists could say, tell me about the naturalism you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in that naturalism either. So why is this a myth? There are many reasons. First, contrary to myth, neither naturalism nor atheism says that no one created something out of nothing. What naturalism says is that the physical exists and if the mental exists, the physical explains why the mental exists. If you look carefully at the definition of naturalism shown on the slide, you'll notice that it says nothing about the universe having a beginning. What naturalism actually implies about cosmology is this. Physical reality does not have an external cause. It follows from the definition of naturalism that if naturalism is true, 
there could not have been any purely mental entity, such as God, which might have existed before and outside of physical reality and which caused physical reality to come into existence. Here's one way to think about it. If you look at the diagram on the slide, you'll notice that naturalism is compatible with physical reality consisting of a single universe, our universe. But you'll also notice that naturalism is compatible with the existence of a multiverse existing, which would mean that many universes exist and our universe is just one of them. If naturalism is true and our universe is the only universe which exists, then naturalism implies either a all of physical reality is contained by the physical stuff in our universe and so our universe is uncaused, or b physical reality is limited to our universe plus some extra physical stuff, whatever that might be, and that stuff caused our universe, but the extra stuff itself is uncaused. In order to avoid any misunderstandings, I don't claim the single universe plus extra physical stuff option is true. Rather, I'm just trying to list all the options. The key point is this. Both versions of what we might call single universe naturalism deny that something outside of physical reality caused physical reality to come into existence. Now let's assume that naturalism is true and our universe is part of a multiverse. Then naturalism implies either A, our universe is uncaused, B, our universe was caused by some extra physical stuff, C, our universe was caused by something in the larger multiverse, which itself is uncaused, or D, our universe was caused by something in the multiverse, which was caused, uh, which was some extra physical stuff, and the extra stuff itself is uncaused. Again, in order to avoid any misunderstandings, I don't claim a multiverse exists. Rather, I'm just trying to list all the options. The key point is this. Both versions of what we might call multiverse naturalism deny that something outside of physical reality caused physical reality to come into existence. Now that I have reviewed the different naturalistic options for physical reality, I can now start to clarify what I mean when I say that Dr. Turek is spreading a myth when he says that the atheist view is that no one created something out of nothing. As I just explained, naturalism is compatible with the hypothesis that our universe came from another part of physical reality. An atheist or naturalist might believe that physical reality consists of just our universe. If so, they would deny that our universe has a cause. But atheists or naturalists might also believe that physical reality consists of more physical stuff than just our universe. If they believe that, then they might believe that our universe came from the other physical stuff which could be something like the quantum foam written about by Lawrence Krauss, or it could be an entire multiverse. Again, I'm not claiming that these scenarios are true, or even probably true. Rather, I'm pointing out that they are examples of how a naturalist could accept Big Bang cosmology while simultaneously not holding what Dr. Turek misleadingly and falsely calls the atheist view. As I have just shown, there is no such the atheist view. Rather, there are a variety of naturalist and atheist views about physical reality, including naturalist and atheistic views about Big Bang cosmology. Let's move on. What does the word nothing mean? In this context, the context of whether our universe began to exist, I find the definition offered by William Lane Craig to be useful. As he said, People like Leibniz and others who posed the question, why is there something rather than nothing, knew what they meant by nothing. Nothing is a term of universal negation. It means not anything. Non-being has no properties. It has no potentialities. Dr. Craig's definition of nothing illustrates the second reason why I think Dr. Turek is spreading a myth when he says that the atheist view is that no one created something out of nothing. Since nothing in this context means absolute nothingness, i.e. not anything, it follows that nothing is not a place. It would be nonsense to say leave Earth in a spacecraft, fly towards Jupiter, and then keep going 25 billion light years in that direction until you get to the part of the universe we call the place nothing. But since the word nothing does not describe a location, it makes no sense to say that physical reality came from nothing. 
Rather, we should say that if naturalism is true, there is no place physical reality came from. And notice we didn't need empirical findings from cosmology to tell us this. This is a tautology. The concept of a place or location only makes sense if space exists. Or to put it another way, the word location is really just shorthand for the expression spatial location. So it is not just naturalists who say there is no place physical reality came from. Supernaturalists, including theists, should also say this. Even theists who believe that God caused the universe do not really believe that the universe came from a spatial location. Sure, you can easily find quotations of both naturalists and supernaturalists, atheists and theists, who say the universe came from nothing, but as soon as you start reading what they mean, I think you'll quickly discover that they are using the word nothing differently from the definition offered by Dr. Craig. There's a third reason why I think Dr. Turek is spreading a myth when he says that the atheist view is that no one created something out of nothing. The reason is this. We don't know that physical reality, or even just our universe, came from nothing. Yes, we know that our universe is expanding, and the expansion appears to have had a beginning. But there's a huge difference between saying our universe started expanding and our universe started expanding from nothing. To say that the universe's inflation is evidence that the universe came from nothing is like saying that if I inflate a balloon, the balloon's inflation came from nothing. But that's false. The balloon's inflation had a beginning, yes, but the balloon did not pop into existence out of nothing and then start inflating. The balloon was pre-existing. Similarly, the inflation of the universe neither implies nor makes probable the claim the universe came from absolutely nothing. The most rational conclusion is that the expansion of the universe began with pre-existing stuff, albeit stuff radically different from anything we currently understand. My second objection to Dr. Turek's argument from the alleged beginning of the universe is that he confuses the evidence for the Big Bang model with the evidence for the Big Bang event itself. Here we need to follow Caltech physicist Dr. Sean Carroll's advice. As he writes, when we talk about the Big Bang model, we have to be careful to distinguish that from the Big Bang itself. With that in mind then, let's look at Dr. Turek's surge evidence. Here I want to quote Dr. Carroll again. He continues, the Big Bang model is an extraordinarily successful theory of the evolution of the observable universe. The Big Bang event is a hypothetical moment that we know almost nothing about. Here's what I think Dr. Carroll means. When cosmologists work backwards in time, they reach a period called the Planck era, which happened just after the start of the universe's expansion. They don't understand what happened at the start of that era. This is why we know that the expansion of the universe had a beginning, but we don't know if the universe itself had a beginning. Now, in response to this objection, Dr. Turek might say, but the letter E in my surge evidence stands for Einstein's general relativity, and that does support the Big Bang event. He's correct that, if applicable, general relativity would support the Big Bang itself, but he's mistaken in assuming that general relativity is, in fact, applicable to the Planck era. As Dr. Carroll explains, the Big Bang event is a prediction of general relativity, but singularities where the density is infinitely big are exactly where we expect general relativity to break down. They are outside the theory's domain of applicability. At the very least, quantum mechanics should become crucially important under such conditions, and general relativity is a purely classical theory. He continues, so the Big Bang event doesn't actually mark the beginning of our universe, it marks the end of our theoretical understanding. We have a very good idea, on the basis of observational evidence, what happened after the Bang event. But the Bang event itself is a mystery. We shouldn't think of it as the singularity at the beginning of time. It's a label for a moment in time that we currently don't understand. 
So Dr. Turek's E in surge doesn't support the claim that the universe had a beginning. Now Dr. Turek's colleague, Dr. Craig, has argued that the borde guth vilenkin or BGV theorem proves that our universe, or more broadly that physical reality as a whole, had a beginning. Dr. Craig writes, quote, the BGV theorem proves that classical space-time, under a single very general condition, cannot be extended to past infinity, but must reach a boundary at some time in the finite past. Now, either there was something on the other side of that boundary or not. If not, then that boundary just is the beginning of the universe. If there was something on the other side, then it will be a region described by the yet-to-be-discovered theory of quantum gravity. In that case, Vilenkin says, it will be the beginning of the universe. Either way, the universe began to exist." End quote. But, contrary to what Dr. Craig claims, the borde guth vilenkin or BGV theorem, does not prove that the universe, or more broadly physical reality, had a beginning. As Craig himself admits, the BGV theorem assumes a classical space-time, but, he doesn't admit this part, but, that assumption is invalid. I contacted Caltech physicist Sean Carroll directly and asked him, in your opinion, what is the probability that the axioms or postulates or assumptions of the BGV theorem are true? His reply is shown on the slide. According to Dr. Carroll, there is, quote, basically zero, end quote, probability that the assumptions, axioms, or postulates of the BGV theorem are true. Now, if the BGV theorem's probability is basically zero, then the BGV theorem provides basically zero support for the claim that the universe, or physical reality, has or had an absolute beginning. Because our understanding of quantum mechanics is incomplete, we don't know what happened before the Planck era, which is approximately 10 to the negative 43rd power seconds after the start of cosmic inflation and therefore we don't know that the universe had a beginning. What we do know is that our universe is expanding and the expansion had a beginning. And so we need to rewrite Dr. Turek's claim. Instead of saying our universe began to exist, we need to delete the word exist and replace it with the word expand so that we have our universe began to expand. But thanks to the distinction between the Big Bang model and the Big Bang event, made by Dr. Carroll, it follows that the beginning of our universe's expansion is not evidence favoring theism over naturalism. The kernel of truth in Dr. Turek's argument is this. Let's assume that three auxiliary hypotheses are true. Number one, the Big Bang event, i.e. an initial singularity, was real. Number two, time is not relative to space, i.e. special relativity is false. And three, physical reality is synonymous with our universe. If we assume those three auxiliary hypotheses are true, and then combine them with the core hypothesis of the Big Bang model, then Big Bang cosmology would provide good evidence that physical reality had a beginning in time. If physical reality itself had a beginning in time, that would seem to be evidence favoring naturalism over theism but we have no reason to believe that any of those three auxiliary hypotheses are true, much less that all three are true. So the fact that our universe began to expand roughly 13.8 billion years ago is not evidence favoring theism over naturalism. Let's move on to Dr. Turek's other major supporting point under the letter C for causality in his crimes acrostic, that the universe is fine-tuned for life. I have six objections to that argument. First, the expression fine-tuning is misleading because it suggests a fine-tuner. A more neutral description is this. We don't know that our universe is fine-tuned. What we do know is that our universe is life-permitting. Second, by themselves, neither naturalism nor theism predicts a life-permitting universe. If we assume that naturalism is true, but abstract away everything else that we know, we would not predict a life-permitting universe because the content of naturalism says nothing about life or a universe which allows for life. So the probability of a life-permitting universe conditional upon naturalism all by itself is less than 0.5.
Likewise, if we assume that theism is true, but abstract away everything else that we know, we would not predict a life-permitting universe because the content of theism says nothing about life or a universe which allows for life. So the probability of a life-permitting universe conditional upon theism all by itself is also less than 0.5. Third, there's still a lot in cosmology we still don't understand. According to our best cosmological evidence, 95.1% of the total mass energy of the known universe is mysterious, composed of either dark energy, which is 68.3% of the total mass energy of the universe, or dark matter, which is the other 26.8%. Dark energy and dark matter seem directly relevant to the attempted design inference here. They are proposed to explain facts about the expansion rate and gravitational effects and other kinds of matter, respectively. Now, the point here is this. If contemporary cosmology cannot explain 95.1% of the total mass energy of the known universe, it seems massively premature to conclude that, on naturalism, the objective chance of life-prohibiting universes is much greater than the objective chance of life-permitting universes. Fourth, nobody knows the objective chance of a life-permitting universe on naturalism. If you want to argue it's low, then you need to know the ratio of life-permitting universes to life-prohibiting universes. But no one has figured out how to do the required mathematical simulations because they'd need to vary the laws of physics themselves, and there are an infinite number of possible laws. Caltech physicist Sean Carroll points out, we just don't know whether life could exist if the conditions of the universe were very different. Fifth, although we don't know the objective chance of a life-permitting universe on naturalism, we do know that a life-permitting universe is more probable on naturalism than on theism. Allow me to explain. If naturalism is true and life exists, the universe has to be life-permitting. The probability of C conditional upon N and L has to equal 1. But if theism is true and life exists, the universe doesn't have to be life-permitting because God doesn't need particular physical laws, conditions, and parameters for life to exist. That's just part of what it means to be God. So the probability of C conditional upon T and L is less than 1. Given that the universe contains life, the fact that life exists in a way consistent with physics favors naturalism over theism. Sixth, claiming fine-tuning as evidence for theism is like pointing to a clean speck of an otherwise dirt-covered car to claim that Mr. Clean owns it. Likewise, the vast majority of the universe is hostile to life. Given that the universe is life-permitting, its hostility to life is more probable on naturalism than on theism. Finally, let's look at the third more specific fact we know about physical reality. In addition to the fact that physical reality exists, we also know that the universe continues to exist. If naturalism is true, physical reality not only has to exist, but it has to continue existing because there is no other part of, of causal reality which could actively knock it out of existence or passively allow it to go out of existence. But if some version of personal supernaturalism like theism is true, and a supernatural being created physical reality, the continued existence of physical reality is not a sure thing. Physical reality as a whole could stop existing at any time, either because the supernatural being actively knocked physical reality out of existence, or passively allowed it to fade out of existence if, for example, it had been sustaining the existence of physical reality and then just stopped. So given that the universe exists, naturalism entails that it will always exist, while theism does not entail this. And thus, the continued existence of the universe is more probable on naturalism than on theism. So let's now return to Dr. Turek's crimes acrostic. He says, or asks, so why can we use our minds, logic, and mathematics to understand truths about the world? And what best explains the intersection between our minds and the orderly external reality? 
Regarding logic, on pages 36 and 37, he writes, quote, some kind of theism explains the laws of logic, but atheism certainly does not. Everything can't be reduced to materials. If the laws of logic are grounded in the nature of the theistic God, then any time atheists offer an argument against God or for atheism, they are actually presupposing that God exists, end quote. I happen to agree with Dr. Turek that the laws of logic are not material, so I'm not going to spend any time reviewing his reasons for saying that the laws of logic are not material. Instead, I'm going to focus on the other part of his argument, the part which I and every other atheist reject. That part is the claim that atheists must presuppose God exists in order to argue against him. In his book, Dr. Turek quotes an exchange between the late Christian Greg Bonson and the late atheist Gordon Stein. Christians loved that debate because Bonson, a professional philosopher who specialized in the philosophy of religion, clearly beat Stein, a physiologist. Indeed, I have publicly criticized Stein's performance as one of the worst debate performances ever by an atheist. Stein was a physiologist and self-appointed debate representative for the Council for Secular Humanism the organization founded by the late secular humanist philosopher, Dr. Paul Kurtz. Obviously, I don't think there is anything wrong with someone who is not a professional philosopher debating a professional philosopher on God's existence. I am not a professional philosopher, and I have debated professional philosophers on God's existence. But the key point is this. If you're going to debate God's existence, but you're not a professional philosopher of religion, you would better study the work of people who are professional philosophers of religion so that you don't end up making the kind of mistake Gordon Stein did. In my Kansas debate with Dr. Turek, I pointed out that almost all of our debate focused on what I called causal reality, the part of reality where some things can cause other things, but ignored another aspect of reality I call a causal reality. I'm not the person who came up with this distinction, Professional philosophers call it the distinction between concrete objects and abstract objects. But instead of using the concrete versus abstract labels, I'm using the causal versus acausal labels because it reinforces what I consider to be the most important part of that distinction. Concrete objects can stand in causal relations, while abstract objects cannot stand in causal relations. Let me give you an example. Some philosophers hold a position called mathematical Platonism, which says that abstract objects exist, and at least some of the abstract objects which exist are mathematical objects like numbers, sets, and functions. To make it really simple, let's focus on just numbers. Mathematical Platonists say that the number 3 exists. Now, whether you agree or disagree with the claim that the number 3 exists, what I am about to say is, I think, not controversial. The point is this. The number three, if it exists, cannot cause anything. Let's now switch our focus back to atheism and naturalism. One version of naturalism is materialism, which says that only material objects exist. By definition, materialism denies the existence of any immaterial objects. By definition, abstract objects are immaterial. So, by definition, materialism denies that abstract objects exist. It follows that, by definition, materialism denies that a causal reality exists. But another version of naturalism, the version I champion, makes no claims pro or con about a causal reality. My version of naturalism is much more modest. It merely says that one kind of causal reality, the physical, exists and if another kind of causal reality, the irreducibly mental, exists, then the physical explains the mental. It says nothing about the existence of a causal reality. It doesn't say that a causal reality does exist, and it doesn't say that a causal reality doesn't exist. So when I encounter an argument, like the one Dr. Turek is making, arguing that the existence of an immaterial reality refutes atheism, I shrug my shoulders. It would be like me arguing Yahweh doesn't exist because the Greek god Zeus doesn't exist. So my first objection is this. Logic is logically consistent, no pun intended, with naturalism. 
Dr. Turek has confused a sectarian version of naturalism or atheism, the materialism of some of his debate opponents and of some of the new atheists, with naturalism or atheism simpliciter. Neither naturalism nor atheism say anything about the existence of a causal reality or abstract objects. At best, Dr. Turek has refuted materialist versions of naturalism and atheism, but he hasn't refuted naturalism or atheism simpliciter. And in fact, if a physical reality exists, the laws of logic have to apply to physical reality. My second objection is this. Positing God assumes, not explains, the applicability of logic. At best, theism explains the existence of physical reality, which you could say complies with the laws of logic, as dependent upon a mental reality, God, which or who also complies with the laws of logic. Theism does not explain why there are any laws of logic at all. Let's move on then to the next aspect of reason, which Dr. Turek claims is a problem for atheism. Actually, there's one other point I need to address before we move on. On page 35, he writes, Why do the laws of logic exist? The laws of logic are grounded in a mind, but just not the temporal, changeable human mind he was advocating. He's referring to um, uh, an atheist. Since the laws of logic are timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and unchangeable, they seem to be grounded in a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and unchangeable mind. Laws only come from lawgivers. That's what all experience shows us. Why think the laws of nature and the laws of logic are the exceptions? End quote. Now this is a, ver a variant of the old laws require a lawgiver argument. It goes like this. One, every law has a lawgiver. Two, there are laws of logic. Three, therefore there is a logical lawgiver. The problem with this argument is that it doesn't work. The reason this argument doesn't work is simple. Laws require a lawgiver only if they are in fact given, made, or invented. When most people think about the word law, the first thing that pops into their head is the kind of law governments make. Let's call those governmental laws. Governmental laws clearly have lawgivers or lawmakers. They were also clearly invented or made up. Nobody thinks that, say, U.S. federal law has existed for all of time. Rather, we all know that if something becomes a law, it becomes a law on a specific date. But when we talk about things like the laws of logic, the analogy doesn't work. Unlike governmental laws, nobody in their right mind would say that at one time the laws of logic didn't work, and then later they did work. Or, for people who believe the laws of logic exist as immaterial objects and a causal reality, nobody believes there was once a time when the laws of logic did not exist, and then a later period of time when they did exist. Here's the point. To borrow an expression from Dr. William Lane Craig, if the laws of logic didn't begin to exist, then it's far from obvious, and I think doubtful, that the laws of logic were made in the same way that governmental laws are made. In fact, I would put the point this way. The laws of logic were discovered, not invented. Not only were they discovered, not invented by man, but if theism is true, they were discovered, not invented by God. Look at the new quotation at the top of the slide. On page 37, Dr. Turek claims that the laws of logic are grounded in the nature of the theistic God. My second objection is this. The idea that the laws of logic are grounded in God, or some fact about God, like his mind, nature, and so forth, denies the objectivity of logic. I'm going to switch topics on you for just a moment. When apologists like Dr. Turek talk about moral values needing God, what they mean is that moral values are ontologically objective, ontologically objective moral values require an ontological foundation, and God is the ontological foundation for moral values. One of the many reasons why that argument doesn't work is that it's self-contradictory. Ontological objective, objectivity just means mind independence. If you say that moral values are somehow grounded in God, you're saying that moral values are somehow grounded in a mind. God. But the claim moral values are grounded in a mind contradicts the claim moral values are mind independent. 
The parallel objection to Dr. Turek's argument from the laws of logic also works. If you say the laws of logic are grounded in a mind, God, then you're denying the claim the laws of logic are mind independent. So, contrary to Dr. Turek's claim, theism doesn't explain the mind independence of the laws of logic. Rather, theism denies the mind independence of the laws of logic. The next aspect of reason, which Dr. Turek says is a problem for atheism, is the applicability of mathematics to physical reality. Turning to pages 35 and 36 of his book, he writes, Why can we do mathematics and arrive at true conclusions about the orderly external world? Men of genius who were not theists have pondered those questions. Physicist and mathematician Eugene Wigner wrote a famous article in 1960 called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. He was asking the question, why can the physical world be described so well mathematically? He offered no firm answer. So, as I read him, Dr. Turek is making two claims. One, mathematics is applicable to physical reality, and two, that fact either presupposes or is best explained by theism. As a quick aside, before I explain why I reject his argument, I want to point out that I find this topic fascinating. In fact, while I was conducting research for my Kansas debate with Dr. Turek, I skimmed several books and articles in the literature about mathematical Platonism, and I look forward to reading those in detail now that the debate is behind me. All right, let me get back on topic. My first objection is this. Dr. Turek oversimplifies, by overstating, the applicability of mathematics to the physical, physical world. I can think of at least two exaggerations. First, I think he ignores instances in which natural phenomena do not have mathematical descriptions or mathematical concepts which do not apply to the physical world. For example, imaginary numbers. Imagine the equation I squared equals negative one. In that equation, the letter I is an imaginary number. It is something which does not exist in the actual world and does not correspond to anything which exists in the actual world. Or consider the concept of infinity. If you're familiar with the work of Dr. Turek's colleague, Dr. William Lane Craig, you know that he is an outspoken defender of the view that an actual infinite is impossible. I don't find Dr. Craig's arguments on that point convincing, but if he were right about that, then the concept of infinity would seem to be another example of a mathematical concept which does not apply to the physical world. Now these are just two examples I came up with off the top of my head. A professional mathematician, which I am not, could no doubt come up with other examples. As they say in the infomercials, but wait, there's more. In addition to mathematical concepts which do not apply to the physical world, there are natural phenomena which do not seem to have corresponding mathematical concepts. Philosopher Mark Steiner, commenting on Eugene Wigner's 1960 paper, wrote that Wigner, quote, ignores the failures, i.e. the instances in which science has failed to find appropriate mathematical descriptions of natural phenomena, which outnumber the successes by far. He ignores the mathematical concepts that have never found an application. See Steiner's book, The Applicability of Mathematics as a Philosophical Problem, page 9. Second, I could be mistaken, but Dr. Turek seems to be suggesting the absolute indispensability of mathematics. If that is his view, I think it's mistaken. There is simply no reason to believe that mathematics is absolutely indispensable to empirical science, and good reason to believe it is not. Rather, if there is something here, it seems much more accurate to say that mathematics is relatively indispensable to empirical science. My second objection is this. It's far from obvious that mathematical objects or mathematico-physical objects exist. This objection could be easy to misunderstand, so I want to clarify what I am and am not saying. First, I am not a materialist, so I am not claiming that mathematical objects or mathematico-physical objects cannot exist because no immaterial objects exist. Second, I'm tentatively in favor of the position that an a-causal reality exists. I'm just not sure if mathematical or mathematico-physical objects are a part of that reality. In other words, I don't claim that such objects do exist, and I don't claim that such objects do not exist. 
I don't know if they do. You could say that I am undecided or agnostic about mathematical Platonism versus mathematical anti-Platonism. Rather, I am simply claiming that mathematical Platonism has not been shown to be true. My third objection is this. Positing God assumes, not explains, the applicability of mathematics to causal reality. Now in my Kansas debate with Dr. Turek, I showed that theism does not predict the existence of physical reality at all. If theism doesn't predict physical reality in the first place, we should be suspicious of the claim that theism predicts that one aspect of a causal reality applies to physical reality. At best, theism explains the existence of one part of causal reality, physical reality, to which mathematics is at least partially applicable, by saying it is dependent upon another part of causal reality, mental reality, to which mathematics is applicable. Theism does not explain why mathematics is applicable to causal reality as a whole at all. My fourth objection is this. If mathematical or mathematico-physical objects exist as part of a causal reality, theism doesn't explain how God could know them. This objection was inspired by something I read in a book called Platonism and Anti-Platonism in Mathematics by a philosopher whose name I am not sure how to pronounce, but I'll say is Mark Balager, spelled B-A-L-A-G-U-E-R. The objection goes like this. Since a causal reality, by definition, does not stand in causal relations with anything in causal reality, theism has the problem of explaining how God, quote, might acquire information from mathematical objects even though there are no signals that pass from the mathematical realm, end quote, into mental reality. Now, the book that I'm quoting wasn't actually talking about God. It was talking about immaterial objects or reality in general. But I think the point applies to God. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, no problem. God is an immaterial being, so God can know immaterial truths like the truths of mathematics. But that won't work. It is not as if God's immateriality puts God into informational contact with mathematical objects. As Balagar writes, quote, the idea of information passing from one non-spatio-temporal object to another is no more intelligible than the idea of information passing from a non-spatio-temporal object to a physical object. The notion of an information transfer is a causal spatio-temporal one. It makes sense only when the sender and receiver are both physical objects, end quote. My fifth objection is this. The applicability of mathematics to physical reality is logically consistent with naturalism. Again, Dr. Turek has confused a sectarian version of naturalism, the materialism and scientism of some of his debate opponents, and of some of the new atheists, with naturalism simpliciter. Naturalism does not say anything about the existence or non-existence of a causal reality and abstract objects, including mathematical objects or even mathematico-physical objects. But if naturalism is logically consistent with the applicability of mathematics to physical reality, then it follows that naturalism cannot be stealing the applicability of mathematics to physical reality from God. Finally, sixth, naturalists can at least partially explain the applicability of mathematics to physical reality, at least where mathematics actually does apply. Assume, for the sake of argument, that mathematical objects do not exist. How then can a naturalist explain the applicability of mathematics to physical reality where mathematics does apply. One option is the theoretical apparatus, or TA, account of applicability. The reason mathematics is relevant to empirical science is that scientists use mathematics as a theoretical apparatus, i.e. to make it easier to say what we want about the physical world. At first glance, the TA account of applicability looks like the kind of thing a materialist or anti-Platonist might say. But notice that the TA account of applicability also works if mathematical or mathematico-physical objects do exist. 
The next aspect of reason, which Dr. Turek says is a problem for atheism, is free will and how it relates to our ability to reason. Turning to page 39 of his book, he writes, Free will and reason don't exist in the materialistic world of atheism. Since the non-rational laws of physics determine everything we think, there's no reason to trust our reason. Obviously, I don't agree with this. Here's why. My first objection to this claim is that it is far from obvious that the concept of free will is even coherent. If free will is incoherent, it is impossible, period. But that means it's impossible on both naturalism and theism. In that case, the main difference between naturalism and theism would be that the set of possible causes in a theistic world would be larger than the set of possible causes in a naturalistic world. The theistic set would include ontologically irreducible mental causes. But regardless of what is in the set of possible causes, what would be the case would be that effects would follow inevitably from their antecedent causes. Suppose, but only for the sake of argument, that free will is incoherent. That wouldn't disprove theism because theism is logically compatible with determinism. Theist theistic apologists often give the false impression that the only choices are atheism with determinism or theism with free will, but that's false. If the concept of free will is coherent, then it would seem that naturalism is logically compatible with free will. Free will might be improbable on naturalism, but it's at least logically consistent with naturalism. Furthermore, theism is logically compatible with determinism. Allow me to explain. If theism is true, then the mind can be more than the brain, and so mental events don't have to be brain events. If mental events don't have to be brain events, then mental events don't have to be the inevitable consequence of prior physical brain events. So, if theism is true, the mind can be non-physical, and so mental events don't have to be physically deterministic. If mental events are not physically deterministic, however, it doesn't follow that mental events are not mentally deterministic. It is at least conceivable, if not logically possible, that theism is true, and all mental events are the inevitable outcomes of prior mental events. If all mental events are the inevitable outcomes of prior mental events, then we could say that some mental version of determinism is true. And in fact, I believe that what I am describing is at least in the same ballpark as what one group of Christian theists, Calvinists, believe. As I understand it, Calvinism denies libertarian freedom. My third objection relies upon the fallacy of understated evidence. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that libertarian freedom is coherent, that libertarian freedom is logically compatible with naturalism, but that libertarian freedom is much more probable on theism than on naturalism. If all of those assumptions were valid, that would hardly be the end of the story, however, for we would know much more about libertarian freedom than the mere tentative or hypothetical fact that it exists. As Purdue University philosopher Paul Draper points out, we also know that there are a variety and frequency of conditions that severely limit our freedom. As an example of the kind of conditions Dr. Draper described in the abstract, consider the very concrete and very tragic story told by Dr. John L. Schellenberg, professor of philosophy at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. As an aside, I got to meet Dr. Schellenberg in person in 2001, just less than a week before September 11th, while I was on vacation in Nova Scotia. I have to say he is one of the nicest people I have ever met. And his books are absolutely must-read books for anyone who would be interested in listening to this presentation. Anyway, let me read to you a couple of paragraphs from his outstanding book, The Wisdom to Doubt which is definitely a book everyone should read. He writes, quote, Consider the true story of three boys, ages 5, 8, and 11, who were found suffocated in the trunk of a car 
on June 25, 2005 in Camden, New Jersey. They climbed in and were trapped when the heavy trunk, which would not stay up on its own, slammed down on top of them. A huge search of the town and area was undertaken, but no one thought to check the trunk of that car. Camden is, at the time of writing, economically depressed and faces many social problems, but its people rallied in these circumstances. Here was something to bring them together. However, when the three bodies were finally found, people were grief-stricken and felt disheartened and let down, and the spirit of the town sank to a new low. Now imagine that the boys had suffered, but had also been discovered before it was too late, when someone thought to check that trunk. People might well have asked, why would God allow those poor boys to suffer so? And the answer would certainly have come, look at the town rallying, needing a boost and getting it, and look at the free will and responsibility exercised by the individual who thought to check the trunk and did so. Which events brought all those good things about? That's why God allowed it. My point here is this. It could have been that way if one of the searchers had thought of the importance of examining that trunk, if God had brought that thought to someone's mind. They would then have had the opportunity to exercise their free will instead of negligently dismissing the thought and going for coffee or whatever, and to exercise it in a very important way, where much hung in the balance. But that is not how things actually occurred. And so we have to say that here an opportunity for the exercise of free will was prevented by God, if God exists, an opportunity of just the sort that free will defenders will say God wishes us to have and use to justify suffering. If we have free will and God exists, the atheist should agree God would wish us to have these opportunities. But here, as so often, the critical opportunities are not made available when so easily they might have been. So many suffer alone when there are individuals about who might have helped if only they had known of the suffering. And that is reason to believe that God does not exist, as the argument above shows." End quote. The conditions described by Dr. Schellenberg are clearly more probable on naturalism than on theism. So, once the evidence about libertarian freedom is fully stated, it's far from obvious that it favors theism over naturalism. Let's move on to the letter I, which stands for both information and intentionality. On page 55 of his book, Stealing from God, Dr. Turek writes, quote, In all our experience, the only forces we see creating informational messages are intelligent minds. Natural forces never do it. End quote. Although I've already addressed this as part of victim, there are some additional points I want to make here. My first objection is that neither naturalism nor theism predict biological information, i.e. DNA. The probability of biological information on naturalism is less than 0.5, and the probability of biological information on theism is also less than 0.5. The chart on the slide shows the different options regarding life on both naturalism and supernaturalism. Naturalism and supernaturalism are both compatible with life existing. They are also compatible with life not existing. Let's zoom in on naturalism. The content of naturalism says the physical exists, but it doesn't actually say anything explicitly about life. In contrast, not only does neither supernaturalism nor theism say anything about life, but neither supernaturalism nor theism require that the physical even exist. On the left-hand side, we have theism all by itself. Theism says God exists. It's possible for God to exist and to intelligently design biological information like DNA, but it's also possible for God to exist and not to intelligently design biological information like DNA. Or, God could have created the universe and designed the laws of physics in such a way that the evolution of biological information was built in to the fabric of physical reality from the beginning. Or, God could have created a completely sterile universe with no life at all. Or, God could have not even created a universe at all. 
The point is this. By itself, theism doesn't predict that life exists, much less that life exists and was specially intelligently designed. Now look at the right-hand side. We have theism combined with the hypothesis of the intelligent design of life. Taken together, those two hypotheses do predict that life was specially intelligently designed. In fact, if both of those hypotheses are true, life has to be the result of intelligent design. You could say that the conjunction of those two hypotheses entail the evidence to be explained, which would be the evidence of biological information. So this is why I say that theism by itself doesn't predict the existence of life, much less the existence of life that is the result of intelligent design separate from God's creation of the universe and any fine-tuning of the laws of physics. Now, although the existence of biological information is improbable on both naturalism and theism, naturalism provides more reason to expect biological information than theism for two reasons. Number one, all known instances of biological information, i.e. carbon-based life, are always associated with physical things. And number two, naturalism, but not supernaturalism, entails the existence of a physical reality. My second objection is this. Dr. Turek's argument for intelligent design in biochemistry is in tension with his ar argument for intelligent design in physics. On the one hand, if we assume that God fine-tuned the laws, initial conditions, and parameters of physics to make the universe life permitting, that is a reason to expect that the emergence of DNA would happen without an additional intervention by God. And so the probability that DNA is intelligently designed, conditional upon theism, and God fine-tuned physics for life, would be less than 0.5. On the other hand, if we assume God specially intervened in the universe to create biological information and DNA, that would be a strong reason to expect that God did not fine-tune the laws, initial conditions, and parameters of physics to make the universe life permitting. And so the probability that physics is fine-tuned for life, conditional upon God existing and God intelligently designing DNA, would also be less than 0.5. And this undercuts a cumulative case for God, like Dr. Turek's, which includes two competing arguments to design. My third objection is this. The argument for the intelligent design of DNA violates the inductive logic rule of total evidence. Again, if you look at the quotation of Dr. Turek, which I've crossed out on the slide, the point he's making might support intelligent design if it were the only piece of evidence relevant to the origin of life. But we also know that the creation of new information is also associated with embodied minds. This counts against a theistic inference of intelligent design. So this argument is a textbook example of a logically incorrect argument known as the statistical syllogism. The argument in this case violates the inductive rule of total evidence. Allow me to explain. Dr. Turek's argument is based upon the work of someone in my neck of the woods, Dr. Stephen Meyer at the Discovery Institute here in Seattle. Dr. Meyer wrote a book in 2009 called The Signature in the Cell. On pages 170 and 171, he wrote this, quote, because we have independent evidence, uniform experience, that intelligent agents are capable of producing specified information, intelligent activity is known to produce the effect in question. The creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity, end quote. It's important to understand the kind of argument Dr. Meyer makes. To be precise, I think Dr. Meyer is making two arguments, and both of them are inductive arguments. At the risk of oversimplifying, I am treating abduction as a type of induction, and I think the way to explain induction goes like this. Inductive arguments don't say, here's a piece of data which proves a hypothesis. This data shows that the hypothesis has to be true. Rather, Inductive arguments say, here's a piece of data which makes the hypothesis probable. It's possible to have this data and have the hypothesis be false, but the data makes it likely that the hypothesis is true. Now, that's a total oversimplification of inductive logic, but for this discussion, it's good enough. 
Dr. Meyer's first inductive argument is a kind of inductive argument called induction by enumeration. It has one premise, which I've numbered one, which says 100% of the known instances of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are intelligently designed. And its conclusion, which I've numbered two, is therefore 100% of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are intelligently designed. As I read him, Dr. Meyer's second inductive argument is a type of inductive argument known as the statistical syllogism. It goes like this. Premise three, 100% of known instances of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are intelligently designed. Premise four, biological information, i.e. DNA, is functionally specified digital information. And a conclusion, which I've numbered five, therefore, biological information is intelligently designed. Unfortunately for Dr. Meyer, he has violated a requirement in inductive logic known as the rule of total evidence. Biological information is an example of what philosophers call the reference class, while intelligently designed is an example of what philosophers call the attribute class. So, Dr. Meyer could have just as easily made two different but parallel arguments. Again, the first parallel argument, call it argument number one prime, is an induction by enumeration. It has one premise, which I've numbered one prime, which says 100% of known instances of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are generated by a mind dependent upon a physical brain. And its conclusion, which I've numbered two prime, is, therefore, 100% of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are generated by a mind dependent upon a physical brain. So, Dr. Meyer could have just as easily made two different but parallel arguments. Again, the first parallel argument, call it argument number one prime, is an induction by enumeration. It has one premise, which I've numbered one prime, which says 100% of known instances of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are generated by a mind dependent upon a physical brain. And its conclusion, which I've numbered two prime, is, therefore, 100% of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are generated by a mind dependent upon a physical brain. And the second parallel argument, call it argument number two prime, is a statistical syllogism. It goes like this. Premise three prime, 100% of known instances of large amounts of functionally specified digital information are generated by a mind dependent upon a physical brain. Premise four prime, biological information, i.e. DNA, is functionally specified digital information. And a conclusion, which I've numbered five prime, Therefore, biological information is generated by a mind dependent upon a physical brain. These parallel arguments show that Dr. Meyer has violated inductive logic's rule of total evidence by cherry-picking the reference class which is most favorable to his desired conclusion. Once the total relevant evidence is fully stated, it is far from obvious that biological information was intelligently designed. And in fact, we can display the case for and against the alleged intelligent design of DNA in a chart like the one shown on the slide. As I argued in my opening statement in my Kansas debate with Dr. Turek, the best explanation is the explanation which has the greatest overall balance of intrinsic probability and explanatory power. Naturalism is intrinsically much more probable than theism because it is, because it is both more, much more modest and much more coherent than theism. For more information on that, please see the transcript of my opening statement available on my blog, The Secular Outpost, which can be found at patheos.com, P-A-T-H-E-O-S.com. This slide introduces a new concept, prior probability, which is something I didn't talk about in my opening statement. Intrinsic probability and prior probability are related, but different. Intrinsic probability says this, if we look solely at the content of a hypothesis or proposition, ignoring all empirical evidence, what is the probability that the hypothesis is true? Prior probability says this, 
there is empirical evidence which functions as background information. In other words, there is empirical evidence which provides a context for saying that other evidence, the evidence to be explained, is odd or puzzling. So if we look at that empirical evidence, the background information, how likely is the hypothesis to be true? On the slide, sentence one has Dr. Meyer's main point that creation of new information is usually associated with mental activity. By itself, meaning if we knew nothing else about the creation of new information other than what sentence one tells us, that piece of background information would favor theism and intelligent design over naturalism and no intelligent design. But we just saw that Dr. Meyer violates the rule of total evidence by understating the evidence. We know more about the creation of new information than that, is, than that it is usually associated with mental activity. We also know that nothing mental happens without something physical happening. And for a defense of that claim, see my debate opening statement on the Secular Outpost blog, again at pathos.com. Given that the creation of new information is usually associated with mental activity, the fact that mental activity is dependent upon physical activity is much more probable on naturalism and no intelligent design than it is on theism and intelligent design. Furthermore, there is another piece of background information which is also relevant to the origin of life. That piece of information is my fourth objection. Naturalistic explanations have a much better track record than supernatural explanations. In the history of science, we have many examples of naturalistic explanations replacing supernatural explanations and no examples of supernatural explanations replacing supernatural explanations. This is much more probable if naturalism is true, because if naturalism is true, all supernatural explanations are false, than it would be if supernaturalism is true, and it is at least possible for a supernatural explanation to be true. Now, I've read almost all of both of Dr. Meyer's books, Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt, so I'm pretty sure that he never addresses this point. If I'm right about that, this is another failure of Dr. Meyer's argument. In fact, just a month before my debate in Kansas, Origin of Life researchers at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego announced they had taken a big step toward conforming a hypothesis called the RNA world hypothesis, which is a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life. According to the announcement, scientists at the Scripps Research Institute have succeeded in creating a ribozyme that can basically serve both to amplify genetic information and generate functional molecules, which the announcement says is a big step toward the laboratory recreation of the RNA world generally believed to have preceded modern life forms based on DNA proteins. Now, I think it would be premature to shout from the mountaintops Intelligent design theorists like Dr. Meyer are wrong. The RNA world hypothesis is true. This is a brand new announcement. The scientific community has had hardly any time to review their findings, and we want to see the experiment repeated by other researchers, and we want to see them get the same results. For this reason, I am treating this as background information and not part of the evidence to be explained. Sentence 2.1 fits within the larger pattern of sentence 2. It provides even more context which supports the prediction of naturalism that if life exists, it is the result of unintelligent, unguided mechanisms. Finally, I've now updated the slide with a new section for explanatory power. At this time, I think explanatory power is a draw. For the reasons I've already stated, the fact that life exists and contains biological information, i.e. DNA, does not favor naturalism over theism. The fact that it is a draw is itself bad news for theism and intelligent design because theism and intelligent design started off with a big disadvantage. Allow me to explain. The final probability of a hypothesis is what you get when you multiply its intrinsic probability by its prior probability by its explanatory power. The best explanation is the explanation with the highest final probability. We can think of testing hypotheses as a race. A hypothesis which has a higher intrinsic or prior probability is like a runner at a track meet getting a big head start. 
while the hypothesis with a lower intrinsic or prior probability is like a runner who has to start farther back. This doesn't mean the disadvantaged runner, in this case theism, can't win. It just means that the theistic runner has to run a lot faster than the naturalistic runner to be the first one across the finish line. In the same way, the explanatory power of theism with respect to biological information has to be much better than the explanatory power of naturalism. In other words, intelligent design theorists have to show more than biological information is more probable on theism and intelligent design as opposed to naturalism and no intelligent design. Rather, they have to show that biological information is much more probable on theism and intelligent design than on naturalism and no intelligent design. But if you go back to my very first objection to Dr. Turek's argument about biological information, you'll remember that I said neither naturalism nor theism predict biological information. And the only way for theism to predict biological information is to combine the hypothesis of theism with another hypothesis, what philosophers would call an auxiliary hypothesis. So in this case, I think it's going to be very hard for the intelligent design community to show that intelligent design and theism won the race for the greatest final probability. Let's move forward to page 61. Dr. Turek writes, even if there were infinite time and opportunities for nature to mutate DNA into the information necessary for new life, that still wouldn't be enough to create a new life form. Why? He writes, that's because DNA alone doesn't dictate the formation of body plans. He continues, in recent years, biologists have been discovering a new form of information critical to body formation called epigenetic information, which is not stored in DNA, but in cell structures. Epigenetic information is that imparted by the form and structure of embryonic cells, including information from both the unfertilized and fertilized egg. In other words, the physical structure of cells early in the process of making new life forms charts a developmental path for the organism." End quote. What are we supposed to make of this passage? Let me briefly quote something Jerry Coyne wrote. Epigen epigenetic inheritance, like methylated bits of DNA, histone modifications, and the like, constitute temporary inheritance that may transcend one or two generations, but don't have the permanence to affect evolutionary change. I know of not a single good case where any evolutionary change was caused by non-DNA-based inheritance. Let that sink in for a moment. With all due respect to Dr. Turek and to Dr. Meyer, if I want to understand the implications of epigenetics for evolution, I'm going to listen to someone with a PhD in biology, like Coyne, not someone with a PhD in the philosophy of science, like Meyer, or a PhD in Christian apologetics, like Dr. Turek. And here we have a biologist, Dr. Coyne, stating that, quote, there are a handful of examples showing that environmentally induced changes can be passed from one generation to the next. In nearly all of these examples, the changes disappear after one or two generations, so they couldn't affect permanent evolutionary change. The other part of I in crimes is intentionality. I've already addressed this as part of victims, so let's quickly review those points. First, naturalism is logically compatible with intentionality. So Dr. Turek is just flat out wrong when he says that atheism has to steal intentionality from God. And second, positing God assumes not explains the fact that intentionality exists. It does not explain why intentionality exists at all. Let's move on to the letter M for morality. On page 89 of his book, Stealing from God, Dr. Turek writes, if God doesn't exist, and were merely the mindless, purposeless products of biological evolution, then morality is subjective. I've already talked about this in Victim, under both V for value and M for morality, which is really deontology. But there's a lot more to talk about. The quotation of Dr. Turek reminds me of something written by William Lane Craig 20 years ago. Dr. Craig wrote, quote, 
If there is no God, then any ground for regarding the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens as objectively true seems to have been removed. Some actions, say incest, may not be biologically or socially advantageous, and so in the course of human evolution has become taboo. But there is, on the atheistic view, nothing really wrong about committing incest, end quote. When we put that remarkable passage into its logical form, what we get is an argument which looks like this. One, if God does not exist, then humans are the byproducts of naturalistic evolution. Two, if humans are the byproducts of naturalistic evolution, then the human herd morality is nothing but a biological ad adaptation. Three, if the human herd morality is nothing but a biological adaptation, then there is nothing that makes the human herd morality objectively true. Four, if there is nothing that makes the human herd morality objectively true, then there are no ontologically objective moral values. Five, therefore, if God does not exist, then there are no ontologically objective moral values. This argument suffers from equivocation. Naturalistic evolution at most shows only that, given naturalism, our beliefs about morality are the product of evolution. It does not prove there are no objective values. As Caroline West notes, after all, it could be true both that there are moral facts out there and that natural selection has led us to believe that there are. Ironically, Craig appears to be guilty of the very thing he accuses his opponents of doing, namely, confusing moral ontology with moral epistemology. And therefore, it seems to me that premise three is entirely dubious. Moreover, if we return to Craig's stated definition of moral objectivity, there seems to be no reason why the objectivity of the herd morality evolved by humans is a necessary condition for ontologically objective moral values. In other words, it could be the case that the herd morality evolved by humans is objectively false, but ontologically objective moral values exist. But that possibility entails that four is false. Let's move on to the letter M for morality. On page 89 of his book, Stealing from God, Dr. Turek writes, if God doesn't exist and we're merely the mindless, purposeless products of biological evolution, then morality is subjective. This next quotation from Dr. Turek comes from an unknown source. I think I got it from one of Dr. Turek's slides shown in the YouTube video of his debate with David Silverman, but I'm not sure. In any case, I think Dr. Turek said or wrote this, quote, if there is no God, then the Nazi Holocaust wasn't immoral. It's just a matter of opinion, end quote. This is another myth. In fairness, again, some atheists have also spread this myth. They're wrong. First, we can fix the error by making a small edit. Delete the words, there is no God, and replace them with, morality is just a matter of opinion. Next, we insert the word objectively before the word immoral. We then have a true statement. If morality is just a matter of opinion, then the Nazi Holocaust wasn't objectively immoral. So the good news is that Dr. Turek has done an excellent job of showing the implications of morality being a matter of opinion. The bad news is that he's done nothing to show that naturalism implies that morality is a matter of opinion. Second, positing God assumes, not explains, the existence of ontologically objective moral value. If you read or listen to Dr. Turek, you'll find him writing or saying, God's nature is the moral standard. Let's unpack that. What does it mean to say that God's nature is the moral standard? Well, it means that all other moral values, like goodness, honesty, and so forth, are valuable because they are grounded in God's nature. So Dr. Turek's explanation for moral value is equivalent to the claim, the reason there are any objective moral values is because there is at least one objective moral value, 
viz. God's morally perfect goodness. God's moral perfection assumes the existence of moral value. So at best, theism only explains all other moral values in relation to God's moral value. It does not explain why there are any objective moral values at all. Third, naturalism is irrelevant to the existence of ontologically objective values. As the slide shows, we can divide value ontology into two camps, objective and subjective. In order for ontologically objective values to exist, all we need is some mind-independent object or property to make value claims true. Philosophers call such objects or properties truth makers, and I think Dr. Turek calls them a standard. Let's try to make this less theoretical and more real. Take the sentence, honesty is of great moral value. If moral values are ontologically objective, we would say that sentence is true because one, there is something, a truth maker, which makes that sentence true, and two, that truth maker is an actually existing object or property, not something dependent upon the subjective states of a person, e.g. will, beliefs, emotions, desires, intentions, attitudes, etc. So the question is this, if naturalism is true, where could we find such truth makers for ontologically objective values, including moral values? On naturalism, there are two places such properties might be found, a causal reality and causal reality. A, naturalism is compatible with ontologically objective values in a causal reality, like the values in Plato's theory, which are not grounded by anything in causal reality and so don't require God. Dr. Tur Dr. Turek rules out this possibility in advance because, as we've seen, he repeatedly mixes up naturalism and atheism on the one hand, neither of which say anything pro or con about a causal reality, with, on the other hand, materialism and scientism, both of which deny the existence of a causal reality. If a causal reality doesn't exist, then moral anti-reductionism is false. And if moral anti-reductionism is false, there are no irreducible moral properties, and so the ethical theories of Eric Wielenberg G.E. Moore, Plato, and people like them are wrong. But naturalism as I've defined it says nothing about a causal reality. So naturalism is compatible with any ontologically objective values which might happen to exist as part of a causal reality. So consider as an example the sentence, honesty is of great moral value. According to moral anti-reductionism, what makes that sentence true is a causal reality, specifically the existence of the ontologically objective moral value of honesty. Or to make it more simple, you could say this, moral anti-reductionists say that honesty exists. B, naturalism is compatible with objective values in causal reality, like the values in Aristotle's theory. Larry Arnhart recently defended a modern version of Aristotle's theory, which says that moral values are determined by natural desires rooted in human biology. So again, consider the example sentence, honesty is of great moral value. According to naturalistic moral reductionism, what makes that sentence true is a naturalistic truth maker. For example, According to Larry Arnhart's version, what makes that sentence true is universal human desires rooted in human biology. Again, I think I said this at the beginning of this video, but Larry Arnhart's theory is based upon Aristotle. What's important to remember is that despite the label, naturalistic moral reductionism is compatible with the existence of God. Not only is Arnhart's theory based upon Aristotle, but so is the ethical theory developed by Thomas Aquinas, the theory called natural law theory. So it's not like you have to be an atheist in order to believe that morality can be ontologically objective without being grounded in God. This pretty much destroys Dr. Turek's claim that atheists have to steal morality from God. If Catholics believe in God, Catholics believe the natural law theory, and the natural law theory doesn't depend on God, then it's pretty much impossible for atheists to steal morality from God when they, atheists, 
adopt an ethical theory that has the same Aristotelian roots as the ethical theory adopted by Catholics, natural law theory. But I don't find anything about this point in either of Dr. Turek's books attacking atheism. So he, if he's got an objection to this argument, he hasn't yet told us what it is. In fact, let's explore this point just a bit further. The diagram on the slide shows a taxonomy or framework for the major different theistic theories of value. On the right hand side are the dependency theories of moral value. As their name implies, all of these theories say that moral value somehow depends on God or some aspect of God, such as his nature or his commands. Dr. Turek's view is shown on the slide as divine nature theory or DNT-A, where the letter A stands for axiology. But on the left hand side of the slide, you see a section for autonomy theories of moral value. Autonomy theories say that moral value does not depend on God. The most famous example of this would be natural law theory, which I mentioned on the last slide. Why do all of these different theories matter? because they show another way in which theism, by itself, is impotent to explain moral value. When apologists like Dr. Turek say that theism explains moral value, they're confusing theism with a dependency theory of moral value like divine nature theory, or DNT-A. On Dr. Turek's view, it isn't theism which explains moral value, it's divine nature theory. But theism doesn't entail divine nature theory. Theism is compatible with divine nature theory, but theism is also compatible with autonomy theories of moral value. For example, a theist could be a Platonist about moral value and say that the truth makers for sentences about moral values could just be platonic forms. Or a theist could follow Aquinas, who argued that the truth maker for sentences about moral values is the rational nature of human beings. Again, the key point is this. Dr. Turek is confusing bare theism, which says nothing about the metaphysical grounding of moral value, with a dependency theory of moral value like divine nature theory. And it's far from obvious that divine nature theory is true. In fact, even if we assume that theism is true, it's still far from obvious that divine nature theory is true. If I were a theist, I would say that moral values aren't grounded in God. I would say that God's nature is grounded in autonomous moral value, which exists a se in a causal reality. Fourth, given that objective values exist, the fact that there is so much disagreement about them is much more probable on naturalism than on theism. Now, I need to make an important clarification here. I am not claiming that moral disagreement is evidence against the objectivity of moral value. In fact, I don't think moral disagreement is any evidence against ontologically objective moral values. The hypothesis ontologically objective moral values exist makes no predictions about agreement or disagreement. And to think otherwise is to confuse moral ontology with moral epistemology. By itself, the hypothesis that ontologically objective moral values, or OOMVs, exist merely says that they exist, period. It says nothing about whether anybody knows them, much less that people can know them, and that people would agree on what is morally good and what is morally bad. This is why moral disagreement isn't evidence against OOMVs. People who argue otherwise are mixing up the hypothesis of OOMVs by themselves, which is the left side of the slide, with the right side of the slide. OOMVs plus the claim that people agree about moral values and disvalues. My point here is different. While the hypothesis of OOMVs provides little or no reason to predict moral agreement, the hypothesis of OOMVs combined with the hypothesis of theism does provide reason to predict moral agreement. Just like a good human parent teaches their children the difference between good and bad, right and wrong, theism combined with OOMVs 
predicts that God would ensure that his creatures know what is morally good, morally bad, morally right, and morally wrong. But that is not what we find. Today, in 2016, there is widespread disagreement among religious believers about morality, and the most common or popular moral beliefs of 2016 are very different from the prevailing moral beliefs in the past. And this is much less probable on theism than it is on naturalism. Now, in support of Dr. Turek's claim that if God does not exist, then morality is just a matter of opinion, he likes to quote a fairly famous passage by biologist Richard Dawkins. In effect, Dr. Turek is making an inductive argument from authority. He doesn't put it like this, but it is an argument from authority. And contrary to myth, arguments from authority can be logically correct arguments or logically incorrect arguments. Uh, it all depends on the details. If we put Dr. Turek's argument from authority into its standard form, we get something like this. Let's define the letter P to, uh, to mean the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. And let's let the capital letter S stand for philosophy. We then get an argument that looks like this. Number one, the vast majority of statements made by Richard Dawkins concerning subject S are true. Number two, P is a statement made by Richard Dawkins concerning subject S. Three, probable, therefore P is true. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What is the actual quotation from Richard Dawkins? Here's what he wrote. In his 1996 book, River Out of Eden, Dawkins wrote this, quote, In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, or any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Now, when you read that quotation, the question to ask yourself is, what is Dawkins' argument? Here's how I analyze the argument. First, start with the words I've highlighted in yellow. In a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication. Those words suggest to me that Dawkins intends to give an argument for naturalism. So let's have the, le the letter N stand for naturalism. Uh, and so naturalism would imply that causal reality is limited to physical reality, i.e. a universe of, as he puts it, blind physical forces and genetic replication. Continuing on, the next words that I've put in yellow, he writes, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it or any justice. And then a little bit later on, he writes, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So when I read that, that suggests to me that he's making, uh, that he's making an inductive argument, an explanatory argument, and the evidence to be explained is what I call E1 the distribution of good and evil, pain and pleasure, success and failure, triumph and tragedy, etc., is morally random. And so what Dawkins seems to be giving is a argument fragment. It's not even a, a full-fledged argument, um, but it's a fragment of an argument. It's the major premise of a Bayesian or explanatory argument for naturalism, uh, an argument known as the evidential argument from evil. He doesn't actually give the entire argument, but he does give the major premise of such an argument, which I'm showing on the slide as premise one. Known facts about evil 
are much more probable on the assumption that naturalism is true than on the assumption that theism is true, i.e. the probability of E1 conditional upon naturalism is much greater than the probability of E1 conditional upon theism. But wait, there's more. I think that Richard Dawkins is also making an additional argument. Look at the words that I've highlighted in yellow on this slide. No evil and no good. When I read that, and I think this is why Dr. Turek is using this quotation, this suggests that Richard Dawkins is talking about metaethics, and specifically the branch of metaethics known as moral ontology. And so if we let the letter O stand for ontologically objective moral values, i.e. moral goodness or good, and ontologically objective moral disvalues, i.e. badness or evil, exist. Again, the, the evidence to be explained seems to be the same as his argument against theism. Uh, E1 stands for the distribution of good and evil, pain and pleasure, success and failure, triumph and tragedy, etc. is morally random. That's the evidence to be explained. And so, again, uh, as I read him, Richard Dawkins is not giving a full-fledged argument, but rather an argument, what I call an argument fragment, uh, the major premise of an argument against moral objectivism, uh, or to be, I guess, to be really precise, axiological objectivism. Um, Again, O represents ontologically objective moral values and disvalues. The evidence to be explained is the moral randomness of facts about good and evil, pain and pleasure, etc. And so his claim, I'm, I'm numbering as one prime, and it says known facts about evil are much more probable on the assumption that O is false than on the assumption that O is true, i.e. probability of E1 conditional upon O is false is much greater than the probability of E1 conditional upon the assumption that O is true. I think, without question, Richard Dawkins' argument against theism is much better than his argument against ontologically objective moral values. And I think that people who, uh, I think that people from a variety of perspectives would agree with that. People who, like me, are metaphysical naturalists but moral realists and think that there are ontologically objective moral values, uh, people like us would definitely agree with that. But I think that even people who reject moral realism would probably agree that um, the way that he's worded it, his argument fragment against theism is, is much, uh, much better than his argument fragment against moral objectivism or moral realism. And the reason for this is that uh, his very terse summary of the problem of evil is consistent with the very powerful defense of the evidential argument from evil by Purdue University philosopher Paul Draper. And on the slide I give just uh, three references out of many that could be given of various articles he's written over the last 20, really now almost 30 years, defending evidential arguments from evil. But his argument against ontologically objective moral values, not so much. And the reason here is, is simple. It's far from obvious why known facts about evil are much more probable on the assumption that O is false than on the assumption that O is true. Now, one possible reason might be the reference to DNA at the end of the passage where he writes DNA neither knows nor cares, DNA just is, and we dance to its music. So maybe that's, maybe that's the reason why he thinks that O is probably false. Let's assume for the sake of argument that that is what he's arguing, since it's so brief, it's hard to tell. Um, Richard Dawkins talks about the indifference of DNA, but it, DNA and O have nothing to do with each other, or at least he doesn't give an explanation as to why they do. Uh, and in fact, I think there are actually two different possibilities here. Number one, 
it could be the case that DNA is indifferent to the moral value of pain and pleasure, and O is true, meaning ontologically objective moral value and disvalue exists. Or it could be possible, uh, too, that DNA is indifferent to the moral value of pain and pleasure, and O is false. Ontologically objective moral values and disvalues do not exist. For example, uh, regarding number one, it, it could be the case that moral anti, what I call moral anti-reductionism is true. And so there are ontolo ontologically objective moral properties that exist, but they're not reducible to non-moral properties like physical properties. And the good exists. Or it could be the case that naturalistic moral reductionism is true, and so moral properties are reducible to physical properties, and the good is the desirable, and facts about universal human desires rooted in human biology help inf inform us about what is good. But unfortunately for Dawkins, I think that he's overstated his conclusion. It's far from obvious why DNA, or anything else about the universe that we observe, is just what we would expect on the assumption O is false. There's one other point I'd like to mention while we're talking about the quotation of Dawkins by Dr. Turek. Have you ever noticed that Christian apologists like Dr. Turek love to quote Richard Dawkins as a hostile witness when it supports their desired conclusion, but not when it doesn't? If the opinion of Richard Dawkins about morality, that it's not objective, is supposed to be evidence for Dr. Turek's claims about the moral implications of atheism, then the opinion of Richard Dawkins about God, that God doesn't exist, should also be evidence for atheism. After all, it seems rather one-sided to appeal to the authority of Richard Dawkins when it helps theism by lending support to a dubious moral argument for God's existence, but then to ignore the authority of Richard Dawkins when it hurts theism by lending support to a robust evidential argument from evil against God's existence. Speaking of making arguments from authority, another argument from authority that Dr. Turek likes, uh, and I say that because he's used it now in two books in a row, both in I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist and also in Stealing from God, on page 92, he writes the following. He writes, if you follow Darwinian principles consistently, you get the kind of moral outworking that James Rachels suggests. Rachels is the author of Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism. He defends the Darwinian view that the human species has no more inherent value than any other species. Speaking of the mentally handicapped, Rachels writes, quote, what are we to say about them? The natural conclusion, according to the doctrine we are considering, Darwinism, would be that their status is that of mere animals. And perhaps we should go on to conclude that they may be used as non-human animals are used, perhaps as laboratory subjects or as food, end quote. And Turek goes on to write, what? Suggesting we use the mentally handicapped people as lab rats or for food? He's just being consistent with the Darwinistic worldview. Now, as someone who's read Rachel's important book several times, I am baffled how Dr. Turek could possibly justify this outrageous, slanderous interpretation of Dr. James Rachel's. First, notice the bracketed word Darwinism in the quotation as Dr. Turek presents it. That's actually completely inaccurate. Rachel's was not considering the doctrine of Darwinism at this point in his book. Rather, he was talking about the doctrine of qualified speciesism. Here is how James Rachel's defines it. But there is a more sophisticated view of the relation between morality and species, and it is this view that defenders of traditional morality have most often adopted. On this view, Species alone is not regarded as morally significant. However, species membership is correlated with other differences that are significant. The interests of humans are said to be more important, not simply because they are human, but because humans have morally relevant characteristics that other animals lack. 
With that definition in mind, let's review what Rachel's actually wrote about qualified speciesism. Quote, there is still another problem for this form of qualified speciesism. Some unfortunate humans, perhaps because they have suffered brain damage, are not rational agents. What are we to say about them? The natural conclusion, according to the doctrine we are considering, and notice that's qualified speciesism, not Darwinism, would be that their status is that of mere animals. And perhaps we should go on to conclude that they may be used as non-human animals are used, perhaps as laboratory subjects or as food. This leads to my second objection to Dr. Turek's quotation of Dr. Rachel's. Not only was Rachel's talking about qualified speciesism, not Darwinism, but Rachel's was describing a problem with qualified speciesism. In other words, Dr. Rachel's was arguing against qualified speciesism. There is simply no justification for Dr. Turek trying to saddle Rachel's with the view he explicitly calls, quote, a problem, end quote, and in fact rejects. Look at what Dr. Rachel's wrote next. Quote, we must distinguish the conditions necessary for having a moral obligation from the conditions necessary for being the beneficiary of a moral obligation. For example, normal adult humans have the obligation not to torture one another. What characteristics make it possible for a person to have this obligation? For one thing, he must be able to understand what torture is, and he must be capable of recognizing that it is wrong. Linguistic capacity might be relevant here. Without lang language, one may not be able to formulate the belief that torture is wrong. When someone, a severely retarded person perhaps, lacks such capacities, we do not think he has such obligations and we do not hold him responsible for what he does. Dr. Rachels continues. On the other hand, it is a very different question what characteristics qualify someone to be the beneficiary of the obligation. It is wrong to torture someone. Someone is the beneficiary of our obligation not to torture, not because of his capacity for understanding what torture is or for recognizing that it is morally wrong, but simply because of his capacity for experiencing pain. Thus, a person may lack the characteristics necessary for having a certain obligation and yet may still possess the characteristics necessary to qualify him as the beneficiary of that obligation. If there is any doubt, consider the position of severely retarded persons. A severely retarded person may not be able to understand what torture is or see it as wrong and yet still be able to suffer pain. So we, who are not retarded, have an obligation not to torture him, even though he cannot have a similar obligation not to torture us." End quote. The above passage proves, beyond reasonable doubt, that Rachel's was opposed to using retarded people as lab rats or food, the exact opposite of the picture painted by Dr. Turek's selective, misleading quotation of Rachel's. In fact, rather than downgrading the moral status of mentally disabled humans to that of animals without rights, Rachel's went in the opposite direction by upgrading the moral status of intelligent animals so that they, like even severely mentally disabled humans, can be the beneficiary of moral obligations. Another example of Dr. Turek's fallacious claims about the alleged implications of atheist morality is found on page 103, where he writes that atheists like Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot were very reasonably following their atheistic belief that without God, everything is permissible. Once again, Dr. Turek is repeating an argument that's very popular among many theistic apologists, and once again, this argument turns out to be a myth. Allow me to explain. The problem with this argument is that it confuses the distinction between consistency and entailment. When we say, when we talk about consistency, we mean this. Let's take two things, X and Y. They could be claims about anything. X and Y are consistent if and only if 
x and y do not contradict each other. For example, let x stand for the proposition Dr. Turek exists. And let y stand for the proposition God made Dr. Turek by creating a six foot tall cucumber and then making the cucumber look like Dr. Turek. X and y are consistent. They're consistent because they don't express a logical contradiction. It would be possible for both X and Y to be true. But notice, although X and Y are consistent, the truth of X does not entail the truth of Y. Entailment works like this. X entails Y if the truth of X means that Y has to be true. So again, let X stand for the proposition Dr. Turek exists. And let Y stand for the proposition God made Dr. Turek by creating a six foot tall cucumber and then making the cucumber look like Dr. Turek. X does not entail Y. It is possible for Dr. Turek to exist without him being a giant cucumber. Just as Dr. Turek can exist without him being a giant cucumber, atheism is consistent with, but does not entail, amorality or nihilism. As Jim Lippert explains, amorality and nihilism are consistent with atheism. It is certainly possible for an atheist to hold that there are no moral truths, that there is no difference between right and wrong. But mere consistency is not the same as entailment. It does not follow that if you are an atheist, it logically follows or is necessary, or I would add, or is implied that you should hold such views. Yet that's what the quoted author is falsely claiming to be the case. And I need to clarify here that in the quotation of Jim Lippard, when he says quoted author, he wasn't referring to Dr. Turek. He was referring to someone else, but the point applies just as much to Dr. Turek as it does to the author that Jim Lippard was referring to. Next, consider the lawgiver argument. Dr. Turek likes the, uh, the following argument, which you can find on page 113 of his book. He writes, one, every law has a lawgiver. Two, there is a moral law. And three, therefore, there is a moral lawgiver. This argument doesn't work. It doesn't work because laws require a lawgiver only if they are in fact given or made. And the laws of nature, logic, and mathematics, and I could actually add rationality, are three or then four examples of laws that are discovered, not invented. And so that allows me to set up a parallel argument that goes in the opposite direction. The laws of nature, logic, mathematics, rationality, and morality did not begin to exist. The laws of nature, logic, mathematics, and rationality also do not have lawgivers, and therefore the laws of morality do not have a lawgiver. Moving on, we get to the letter E in crimes, which stands for evil. Dr. Turek writes, but while evil is a challenge for Christians, it creates an even bigger challenge for atheists. Now, with all due respect to Dr. Turek, while you will see this point in many non-academic books which talk about the problem of evil, you'll have a hard time finding it in any academic books or journal articles on the problem of evil, even in books or articles written by Christians who specialize in the problem of evil. Why? Because it's a bad argument. And I'm just going to go through this very quickly. First, Notice that the letter E, evil, is redundant with the points Dr. Turek makes under the letter M for morality in his crimes acrostic. If morality can exist without God, then evil can exist without God. But secondly, this is completely irrelevant to whether or not there's a good argument from evil for naturalism or atheism. Why? Well, look. Uh, if you're a theist, you theists believe that X, Y, and Z are evil. You theists believe that God is good. 
you theists believe that good persons are opposed to evil. So you theists need to explain why a God who is good, in your sense of good, would allow so much apparently pointless evil in your sense of evil. If you can't explain it, then that is a problem for the internal coherence of your worldview. Turning to page 120 of his book, Dr. Turek invokes Hitler. He writes, quote, Hitler justified the Holocaust by citing evolution. So while he, Hitler, didn't officially claim to be an atheist, his beliefs were atheistic. Once again, this argument doesn't work. The reason the argument doesn't work is shown on the slide. If you look at the passage quoted by Dr. Turek and try to put it into its logical form, Hitler appeared to be making the following argument. Premise one, all living things are engaged in a struggle for survival, only the fittest survive. That in fact is the only premise of the argument and notice that it's a non-ethical premise, meaning it states uh, it states a descriptive fact, what is the case, not an ethical fact or ethical claim about what ought to be the case. We don't get that until we move to the conclusion. Two, therefore, it is right to allow the strongest to survive and wrong to allow the weakest to survive. So in the conclusion, the word right is expressing an ethical claim about what ought to be the case. So what can we say about Hitler's argument? Well, the most important point, I think, is that it's invalid. The conclusion does not follow from the premise. Just because living things are engaged in a struggle for survival and only the fittest things survive, it doesn't follow that it is morally or ethically right to allow the strongest to survive and that it is morally and ethically wrong to allow the weakest to survive. That is an invalid argument. So. Assuming that Dr. Turek and Dr. Geisler are accurately representing what Hitler actually wrote, that doesn't actually really help them because Hitler's argument is just wrong. Hitler may have in fact used Darwin's theory to justify his genocidal racist policies, but if he did, he was abusing Darwin's theory because Darwin's theory isn't an ethical theory. On page 140, Dr. Turek gives the illusion of a cumulative case for theism over and against naturalism. And he has a chart which lists on the left-hand side all of the evidence which is supposed to be evidence for the existence of God. Things like the universe's beginning, its fine-tuning, laws of nature, reason and the applicability of logic and mathematics, information and intentionality, life, mind and consciousness, free will, objective morality, beauty and pleasure, Old Testament prophecy, and Jesus' life and resurrection. But this is nothing more than an illusion created by Dr. Turek cherry-picking the evidence. Allow me to explain. I'm going to quote something written by Dr. Paul Draper, a philosopher at Purdue University, in an unpublished paper titled Partisanship and Inquiry in the Philosophy of Religion. Here's what Dr. Draper wrote. Proponents of a theistic argument are guilty of the fallacy of understated evidence if they successfully identify some general fact F about a topic X that is antecedently more likely on theism than on naturalism, but ignore other more specific facts about X, facts that, given F, are more likely on naturalism than on theism. To see this in action, we first need to make some edits to Dr. Turek's list. Let's start by deleting the items from his list which aren't really evidence. We can delete reason, information, and objective morality because positing God assumes, not explains, those alleged items of evidence. Next, Although I don't have the time to go into detail here, we can also delete Old Testament prophecy and Jesus' life and resurrection. For a response to apologetic arguments from Old Testament prophecy, see my ebook, The Jury Is In, The Ruling on McDowell's Evidence. For a response to arguments for the resurrection, 
see my book, The Empty Tomb, Jesus Beyond the Grave, and also my online response to Dr. Turek's book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, where I show that his use of the New Testament commits a fallacy of statistical reasoning known as the base rate fallacy. So our revised list now looks like this. Notice that I've moved evil down to the bottom of the right hand side. I'll explain why later. Let's now take a look at how Dr. Turek commits the fallacy of understated evidence. Let's start by looking again at his claim that the universe had a beginning. I've already pointed out that the evidence doesn't support that claim, but let's assume, for the sake of argument, that he were right about that. The fact that it began to exist hardly exhausts what we know about our universe. We also know that it began to exist with time, not in time, and that fact is more probable on the assumption that naturalism is true than on the assumption that theism is true. We also know that the vast majority of the universe is hostile to life. Given that the universe is life permitting, the fact that so much of it is hostile to life is much more probable on naturalism than it is on theism. Next, consider the laws of nature. Again, assume for the sake of argument that the laws of nature are evidence for God's existence. We know more than just there are laws of nature. We also know that the laws of nature don't explicitly appeal to supernatural agency. Given that the laws of nature exist, the fact that science has been so extraordinarily successful in explaining so much about our universe without appealing to supernatural agency is much more probable on naturalism than it is on theism. Next, let's pretend that the existence of life is more probable on theism than on naturalism. We know more about life than just the fact that life exists, however. We also know that complex life evolved from simpler life. Given that life exists, the fact that complex living things are the products of evolution is much more probable on naturalism than on theism. We also know that only a fraction of living things, including sentient beings, thrive, and even smaller fraction thrive for most of their lives, and almost none thrive for all of their lives. Only a fraction of living things, including the majority of sentient beings, thrive. In other words, very few living things have an adequate supply of food and water, are able to reproduce, avoid predators, and remain healthy. An even smaller fraction of organisms thrive for most of their lives, and almost no organisms thrive for all of their lives. If naturalistic evolution is true, this is what we would expect. If all living things are in competition for limited resources, then the majority of those organisms will not survive long enough to thrive. Moreover, even those organisms that do thrive for much of their lives will, if they live long enough, deteriorate. However, if theism is true, why would God create a world in which all sentient beings savagely compete with one another for survival? Does anyone really believe that this could be morally justified? Given that life exists, the fact that so few sentient beings ever flourish is much better predicted by naturalism than by theism. Next, we come to mind and consciousness. This is the one item on the list I agree with. We are conscious beings, and consciousness is evidence favoring theism over naturalism. But once again, Dr. Turek understates the evidence. We know more about consciousness than just the fact that it exists. We also know that consciousness is dependent upon the brain, and that fact is more probable on naturalism than on theism. Next is free will. Again, I'm not sure that the concept of libertarian free will is even coherent, but for the sake of argument, let's assume that it is coherent, that it exists, and that it favors theism over naturalism. In that case, we would know more than just free will exists. We would also know the variety and frequency of conditions that severely limit our freedom. If we grant the assumption that free will exists, these facts are much more probable on naturalism than on theism. Finally, we come to beauty and pleasure. I don't think either of these are evidence favoring theism, and, in fact, I think facts about pleasure favor naturalism over theism. But let's assume, if only for the sake of argument for now, that beauty and pleasure were evidence for God's existence. Again, we know more than this highly selective presentation of the evidence by Dr. Turek. 
We also know that ugliness and pain exist. Given that beauty exists, the fact that our universe is not saturated with auditory, tactile, or other sensory beauty is evidence favoring naturalism. Furthermore, as I argued in my opening statement in my Kansas debate with Dr. Turek, pain and pleasure are systematically connected to the biological goal of reproductive success. That fact is very much more probable on naturalism than on theism. So, for each topic of genuine theistic evidence listed by Dr. Turek, he has understated the evidence. There are other more specific facts about each topic facts which clearly favor naturalism over theism. Once the evidence is fully stated, either the evidence about a specific topic or all of the evidence for all of the topics, it is far from obvious that it favors theism over naturalism. But there's another way to look at the data. For each item of evidence, we can look at when it was discovered. Precise dates aren't the point. Rather, the point is the rough order of magnitude for how long humanity has been aware of the evidence. If you look at the evidence in the theistic column, you'll see that most, but not all of it, has been known for thousands of years. This is why it seems to me that for most of human history, the available evidence favored theism, not naturalism. In contrast, most of the evidence for naturalism wasn't even discovered before two centuries ago. Furthermore, notice that most of the naturalistic evidence including the evidence about the biological role of pain and pleasure, are scientific discoveries. That state of affairs is much more probable on the assumption that naturalism is true, and the progress of science involves more and more correct scientific explanations, explanations which do not appeal to supernatural agents, than on the assumption that theism is true, and a correct scientific explanation could involve supernatural agency, and so antecedently, there is no reason to predict the progress of science would involve an increasing number of correct naturalistic explanations. Finally, let's move on to the letter S for science. Dr. Turek writes the following, <clears throat> quote, the following truths about reality are not made of or completely explained by molecules, yet they comprise the foundation of science. Truth exists and can be known. The laws of nature are orderly and consistent. Effects have causes, law of causality. Causes in the past were like those in the present, principle of uniformity. Our senses are giving us accurate information about the real world, realism. The immaterial laws of logic and mathematics apply to the material world. We have free will to make choices and to follow the evidence where it leads. We can make rational inferences from the data to establish true premises and draw valid conclusions and we should report our results accurately. Objective moral values exist. So what I want to do is put this into a table. Each of the items in the quotation you saw on the previous slide is in the leftmost column titled Alleged Presupposition of Science. The other columns will serve as a kind of scorecard for his claims. The second claim asks, is that alleged presupposition of science an actual presupposition of science? The third column asks, is that presupposition of science logically consistent with naturalism? If a presupposition of science is logically consistent with naturalism, then naturalists can't steal the presupposition from God when doing science or appealing science. Appealing to science, that is. The fourth column asks, does theism assume that presupposition? And the fifth column asks, does theism explain that presupposition? If theism merely assumes the presupposition instead of explaining it, then positing God doesn't help us to explain the presupposition of science. Let's start with morality. We've already covered this in great detail. Naturalism is compatible with objective moral values and objective moral duties or obligations. And positing God assumes, not explains, morality. Next, let's move on to free will. We've also already covered this. The coherence of free will is far from certain. If it's incoherent, it's, um, it's impossible on both naturalism and theism. Next, logic and mathematics. Again, we covered this when we talked about the letter R for reason and crimes. The applicability of logic and mathematics to physical reality is logically consistent with naturalism. And positing God assumes, not explains, the applicability of logic and mathematics to causal reality. 
Next, we get to realism, which is the label Dr. Turek uses. Here I think we need to make a distinction between the general accuracy of sense data and the specific inaccuracies of sense data. Neither naturalism nor theism by themselves predict the general accuracy of sense data. If we combine naturalism with evolution, call that naturalism plus, then we could say that naturalism plus explains the general accuracy of sense data by the fact that the general accuracy of sense data systematically promotes survival. I believe that theists would say that if we combine theism with the thesis that humans are made in the image of God, that would also somehow explain the general accuracy of sense data. But we know more than just that sense data is generally accurate. We also know that there are specific circumstances and conditions in which sense data is inaccurate. Naturalism plus can explain that more specific fact as the imperfections of natural selection, while theism plus doesn't explain it. You'd have to combine theism plus with another Christian doctrine, perhaps something like the fall giving you theism plus plus in order to explain, or explain away, the specific inaccuracies of sense data. Next, we have uniformity. Again, I covered this at the beginning of the video. Uniformity is logically compatible with naturalism. Uniformity is intrinsically more probable than variety, and therefore theism is not needed to explain the uniformity presupposed by science. Next, let's move on to our ability to reason. Not only is this logically compatible with naturalism, but naturalism, or to be more precise, naturalism plus, can explain reason, i.e., are generally reliable cognitive mechanisms. On the assumption that naturalism plus is true, reason is explained by natural selection. Generally reliable cognitive mechanisms systematically promote survival. Orderly natural laws are logically consistent with naturalism. Furthermore, notice that given that orderly natural laws exist, their complete lack of reference to supernatural agency is strong evidence favoring naturalism over theism. This was, in fact, one of my arguments for naturalism in my opening statement in my Kansas debate with Dr. Turek, so you can read the transcript of that statement for my details. Finally, there's causality. I was originally going to agree with Dr. Turek that causality is presupposed by science, but then I reviewed Dr. Carroll's debate with William Lane Craig. As paradoxical as it sounds, Causality might not actually be a presupposition of science, or at least all science. Dr. Carroll argued that the language of physics is differential equations, not causality. Chemical equations are formulated in terms of the reactants and products of the reaction, not causality. But that point is not very intuitive. So let's assume, if only for the sake of argument, that causality really is a presupposition of science. In that case, then the points I made earlier in the video apply. First, causality is logically consistent with naturalism, and second, theism assumes, not explains, causality.